Great, let's get started. So this session is going to be a, a whirlwind overview of machine learning at AWS. Uh, my name is Kunal Batra. And just really quickly, let me just make sure my setup's correct. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> Excuse me. So a little bit about me, just to calibrate any of the questions that might come up during this presentation or through any of our communication afterwards. Uh, I'm a senior developer advocate here at AWS. Essentially, I just build awareness and adoption of our offerings to developers everywhere. I've worked on a lot of different developer-focused verticals. So if you have any questions on any of those verticals, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, or if any questions on any of this talk, feel free to reach out to me on my email on the bottom right, kbatra at amazon.com. Or you can reach me on Twitter at Kunal732. Uh, Twitter is by far the fastest way to get in touch with me. Uh, I am uh, really passionate, and it's a hobby of mine, for computer vision. So on that left photo over there, you can see uh, my, the garage door of my parents. I actually built an app for them that lets them know whether the garage door is open or closed. Uh, they love that one. <clears throat> and then on the right, uh, built uh, an application recently counting how many people are in line at Shake Shack and Madison Square Park where I live. Both of these were built using one of our uh, machine learning uh, suite of services called SageMaker. And we'll talk about that in a bit. And also keeping busy in the quarantine, I uh, recently built uh, an object detection algorithm uh, for my Nintendo uh, Switch over here, just so I wouldn't lose it. So again, this is a hobby, this is a passion. If you have any questions on computer vision at all or at any time, feel free to get in touch with me. Happy to walk you through anything I built or uh, kind of help you with anything you're building as well. So let's get started. Uh, the first thing here, our mission here at AWS is to put machine learning in the hands of all developers. So whether you are <clears throat> a machine, whether you are a data scientist or you're a developer that doesn't have any machine learning expertise, we want to make sure that we have the services that you can take advantage of. So we break down uh, machine learning here at AWS actually into three different layers. And we're going to go from the top to the bottom of these of the slide. So on top over here, we have our AI services. These are services that any developer can take advantage of, uh, whether you have machine learning expertise or not. Uh, a lot of these are services or models that we've cr uh, created and trained internally at Amazon.com or AWS, and we've opened them up to our developers as APIs. Now, if you go one uh, layer lower to the ML services over here, this is a suite of tools and services uh, that fall underneath the Amazon SageMaker umbrella, and we'll go over uh, a couple of these services too in a bit. Now, that last uh, layer on the bottom over here, uh, these are the machine learning frameworks and infrastructure, and this is specifically for uh, advanced machine learning practitioners. Uh, you can see some uh, common frameworks and interfaces on the bottom left of this slide. Uh, we have teams dedicated to these frameworks to make sure that they run optimized on AWS. Uh, and then advanced machine learning practitioners can also take advantage of our infrastructure uh, and deploy that as well. <clears throat> so AWS is framework agnostic. Uh, whatever framework that you want to use, we want to make sure that it runs uh, perfectly on our cloud. Uh, so you can run that fully managed uh, using SageMaker, or you can run that yourself uh, with a bunch of EC2 uh, instances as well, if you so choose. And not trying to sound salesy here, but um, TensorFlow is something that is important and it's big in AWS. 85% of all TensorFlow workloads uh, run in uh, the AWS cloud. And we want to make sure that TensorFlow, just like any other framework, is optimized for AWS. So here's an example here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's an example here. Uh, stock TensorFlow runs at 65% scaling efficiency with 256 GPUs. But if you look at AWS uh, optimized TensorFlow, so this is a version of TensorFlow that's been comp compiled and to run on the AWS cloud and fine-tuned, uh, that runs at 90% scaling efficiency. So what that means is uh, you can actually train uh, uh, a ResNet 50 architecture on ImageNet in under 15 minutes, which is quite fast. <clears throat> so this can actually, uh, you can take advantage of our deep learning frameworks uh, in a couple of methods here. You can use our deep learning AMIs, 
uh, and you can load that up onto EC2 instances, or you can take advantage of our deep learning containers and just get advantage of all those frameworks and services that you would need to uh, start uh, getting started on your machine learning journey. Now, uh, going down one level to machine learning services, uh, this is uh, falls for SageMaker, and these are services for developers as well as data scientists to really help you build, train, and deploy your machine learning models. And this is a, a quite simplistic view of the machine learning journey, uh, data prep, model training, model inference. Um, the one thing to know here is this is not a straight line. Uh, that machine learning journey is almost an art. Uh, it's very iterative, like the machine learning practitioners on this talk know. Uh, a lot of it is going back and forth, uh, checking different models, uh, making sure your hyperparameters are correct. Uh, so this by no means is a straight line. And it's, uh, again, it's an iterative process. And we want to make sure that with SageMaker, we can help you out on this journey. So one of my favorite services here uh, at AWS is a service called Ground Truth. And when we uh, spoke to our customers, uh, they let us know that 80% of the time it takes to actually build and deploy their model comes from that data labeling phase. And data labeling is a tough and time consuming problem. So we introduced a service uh, called Ground Truth and uh, this is a great service. And at the end of this presentation, I'll have my email up again. Uh, happy to provide credits for anyone who's interested in playing around with this or any of the other uh, features uh, that you see in this slide. Um, just reach out to my email. I'm happy to provide credits for this. But again, this is one of my favorite services. So Ground Truth uh, does a couple of things to really help you with that data labeling process. First, it helps you speed up uh, how you can, how quickly you can label that data by providing uh, pre-built workflows that you can provide labelers to annotate your data. And we'll look at that at the next slide. Um, on top of that, it also gives you access to data labelers, different pools of data labelers that you can use to annotate your data. Then it also uh, does something called annotation consolidation, which we'll see in a couple of slides that helps you get accurate results from those uh, annotators. Uh, it also has active learning, so you can uh, save a, a lot on the costs that it takes to label your data um, that you use for training your machine learning model. So some of the pre-built uh, labeling workflows here, you can see on uh, the left-hand side, these four boxes here, and we have more than just these, uh, the workflow showcased here, but essentially uh, we make it easy for your annotators to do uh, bounding boxes on your image data sets uh, for object detection models. Uh, they can also easily choose categories for image classification or text classification. Uh, they can also, um, if you're doing semantic segmentation, uh, labelers can have an easy interface to go at the pixel level and tell you where an object is. Uh, these are some of the pre-built labeling workflows that we've created to help make it easier. Uh, however, if we don't have something you need, you can go ahead and uh, create your own custom workflow. And I've seen this uh, from, com uh, from customers for audio classification. So we try to simplify that process for annotating. Um, after that, we want to make sure that you can access uh, human labelers to uh, actually annotate this data, right? So you can take advantage of Mechanical Turk. Mechanical Turk is a workforce of over 500,000 strong. It gives you, uh, it's great for fast labeling, for non-sensitive data, uh, and there's lower price sensitivity for that. But now there's going to be instances where uh, you require subject matter expertise that you can't find on Mechanical Turk, or you have um, sensitive data that you require in-house labeling or through a third party with that you choose. So with that private workforce, uh, you essentially are choosing who you want to label that data. Now, uh, the third uh, classification we have here are third party vendors that we've partnered with. Uh, you can take advantage of their subject matter expertise that they might have, or uh, it could be for different support plans that they offer it might be something that your organization might need. Uh, so right now we've just showcased um, simplifying that ability to annotate your data with those workflows, giving you uh, access to those labelers. And then um, another thing is once you get those labelers, you want to make sure that they provide accurate results, right? Uh, and normally when I'm giving this presentation, it's in a room and I'm asking everyone uh, if they can uh, 
act as those labelers just for this one slide and tell me what dog are they seeing on the top left of that slide there, right? So uh, in this case, uh, since it's uh, virtual, uh, I'll just let you know that uh, people tend to answer two answers, uh, either a Sharpe or a Bulldog. Uh, and the Sharpe is the correct answer here. So, but for this slide, let's take a look at a, a possible scenario. We have four labelers who are gonna annotate this data. Uh, and three of them say Bulldog, only one says Sharpe, but Sharpe is the right answer. So if with majority voting, obviously the result will be Bulldog and this uh, piece of data will be uh, mislabeled. But at AWS, we also have the options to do uh, probabilities and the Bayes theorem. So in this case, uh, you can start taking a look at the accuracy of the labelers. So you can see that the person uh, who labeled Sharpe is a little bit more accurate than everyone else. And now with the Bayes rule and another, uh, something else known as expectation maximization happening internally here at, with Ground Truth, uh, you no longer get uh, Bulldog as the answer. It'll actually be Sharpe as the answer and this is gets labeled correctly. Uh, and this is, uh, this is actually really interesting. Um, I, I found uh, interesting diving deep into how we did this. And if anyone else is interested, uh, I put it on this slide over here. Uh, we're using something called expectation maximization. I created a bit.ly link around it. So if you're interested in learning more and how we help uh, making sure that the accuracy of labelers is uh, optimized, you can take a look at that. The other thing uh, that I want to talk about with Ground Truth is it lets you do uh, active learning and auto labeling. So you can take a look at the slide over here. On the left hand slide, you can see that input data set. You have your dog. You are now sending this to labelers and they are going and uh, drawing bounding boxes around your uh, object over here. So uh, this is great, this is fine, but now with active learning, you get to save costs. So after you reach about a thousand labeled pieces of data, you have the option to now start training a model. Uh, and once that model is done, now instead of sending your data to labelers to uh, get labeled, uh, you can now start sending it to that model, which uh, reduces costs quite a bit. So a large, uh, the larger the data set, the more cost effective this option becomes. Uh, now, here's the thing to note is in the beginning, um, that accuracy might not be great. You might be sending it new data it's never seen and it's trying to classify it and it might not be great. So when the confidence score is low, it'll go ahead and again, send that back to the human labelers and start labeling that data. But after time, once you start seeing enough of each of these categories, it starts getting a better and higher accuracy. And then it starts switching over to just that uh, model. So that's, that's a part of Ground Truth. And Ground Truth is, again, part of that suite of services uh, under that SageMaker umbrella. Now, another thing we introduced uh, this past reInvent is something called SageMaker Studio. And this is really uh, interesting and something I enjoyed very much. Uh, essentially, what we're trying to do is provide that developer IDE experience to machine learning developers for your own models. Again, uh, this is an iterative, iterative process and almost an art, I would say, to creating models that are accurate and something that you can use. So with the IDE, uh, SageMaker Studio, we really wanna make this simpler. Um, we have the ability to uh, track experiments, monitor your model, debug, and also uh, help you uh, uh, explore all of the possibilities that you can use for your model, taking advantage of something called autopilot, which we'll talk about uh, in a couple of slides. So here's an example of how that SageMaker uh, Studio IDE looks like. Um, if you wanna access this, currently it is only available on US East 2. So basically you just go to SageMaker and then in the top left portion of the console, you're gonna see SageMaker Studio link, which will let you uh, load this up. Now, uh, if you are a machine learning practitioner, uh, this might look familiar to you. This is actually built on top of Jupyter uh, Labs. So it's a very similar interface over here. Um, you do see the additional add-ons that uh, the IDE provides you. Uh, so you can see the different uh, experiments running over here in the top left. And you can um, also see on the right-hand side your actual notebook and your code uh, running there as well. 
So everything's provided to you on this single pane of glass that really helps simplify that machine learning model uh, building journey. So uh, part of the, there's a couple of features that are packed into this IDE. One is um, uh, you can view all your experiments in one place. So the machine learning process, it creates a lot of these artifacts, um, these experiments that are hard to track. And with uh, the IDE, with SageMaker Studio, you can put them all in one place for easy comparisons, visualizations. You can organize, rank, and sort your models based on like some sort of metric. Uh, it gives you that ability to start working and start seeing uh, what's happening. Another interesting thing about SageMaker Studio is the actual notebook experience. So prior to this, when you wanted to create a notebook, you had to uh, load up an EC2, I mean, notebook instance in SageMaker. And then from there, that took a couple of minutes. And then from there, you can go ahead and start creating a notebook inside of that instance um, and then start getting to work. So uh, now you have the ability to create a notebook uh, in underneath 30 seconds. And uh, let me uh, just quickly get out of this and show, hopefully everyone can see uh, the browser here. If not, Ron, just let me know. Otherwise, I'll keep going. Um, but essentially, this uh, the browser is loaded up onto SageMaker Studio. And when you want to create a new notebook for a new model, uh, again, it's just really easy. You automatically see the screen, welcome to Amazon SageMaker Studio. You just click create a notebook. And then from there, uh, it just essentially asks you what kernel you want. And so we can say data science, we can say uh, we want something that's CPU optimized for MXNet, for TensorFlow, and then we can get started from there. We can just go ahead and select and automatically do that. Uh, another interesting thing about um, SageMaker Studio over here uh, is the ability to share your notebooks, right? So uh, here's a notebook um, that I was playing around with. Um, this is actually a sample notebook that we provide, and we provide a lot of great sample notebooks that kind of walk you through a lot of these features. And I'll have a, a link to that at the end as well. So I definitely recommend checking that out. But this is a sample notebook here on uh, autopilot, which we'll talk about in a bit. But essentially, the point of this is not the autopilot functionality. The point of this is our notebooks now give you the ability to share easily with other colleagues, right? So all you need to do is click the share button on the top right of the notebook. And from there, it creates a shareable snapshot of this. I can say include the Git repo uh, information that's already part of it, include the output that I've already done with this, go ahead and create that shareable, sh uh, shareable snapshot. And from there, I can copy that link and send it to a colleague. They can go ahead and run it. All the dependencies, everything is already there to go. Um, easily reproducible work to see what another uh, person is doing. So that's one of the benefits of uh, this process. Let me just go back into my PowerPoint presentation here. And so those are notebooks that are part of SageMaker Studio. So we just showcase this. Uh, the other thing now, again, like any other IDE, is having that ability to have a debugger, right? And uh, with the actual training process, there's not really a lot of visibility into that, right? So with the debugger, um, the idea is to make sure that your model is progressively learning and uh, it's learning the correct values for its parameters. Um, we can get alerts if the, if anything, if it detects common errors, such as uh, gradient values are too low or too high. Um, and then it gives us the ability to kind of figure out what's going on with that from those alerts. So for example, uh, if we're suffering from vanishing gradients, we can maybe decide as a network uh, too deep, maybe the learning rate is too small. It lets us uh, debug. So that's with debugger. Um, and then again, uh, I've had this slide up here again to showcase that this is not a linear process. This is very iterative. Uh, there are a lot of different combinations in terms of what you can do for training your models, whether that's the hyperparameters you use, whether that's uh, the different algorithms that you can choose from, uh, a lot of combinations. So we introduced a new uh, feature here that's actually really interesting. It's called autopilot. And essentially, what you do is you give it a tabular data. So rows and columns, you give it tabular data, and you specify a column that is your prediction target. So this is your training data. You, t you let it know which column that you want to predict on, and then it does everything else for you. That's all you give it, 
everything else for you. It does, it figures out whether you need to do regression or classification. It does all the feature engineering for you. It does all the uh, hyperparameter optimization for you. Um, it takes care of everything else. And it's uh, basically, this is uh, auto melt, but it's not a black box. It gives you insights on why it chose uh, different options like it did. Um, and it's actually pretty fascinating. So let me showcase a little bit of it. So the first thing, once you give it your data, it analyzes your data set, calculates statistics, determines the combination of instant types, uh, pre-processing and algorithms to evaluate. From there, it creates uh, two notebooks. Now these two notebooks tell you insights and what it learned about your data and also uh, insights on what it's going to do now to uh, kind of create this exhaustive search of models to create. And then from there, it creates these pipelines where it starts training multiple models. And it, again, it's really simple to get started. So let me just uh, showcase this right now by going back to my browser. And hopefully you can see my browser here. Let me show, uh, this was a notebook screen, but let me go back into uh, this launch. This is the initial screen you see with Studio. So over here, uh, we wanna say build model automatically. And I'm gonna click on the link, create autopilot experiment. Now, you really don't have to give this much. Basically, you just create a name. Over here, I can just say sample. Uh, and then from there, we just give it the input data, right? We just tell it which S3 bucket does our tabular data exist in. And then from there on top of that, we can just choose the output location. Uh, and that's it. You have other options you can choose from. Uh, right now, I have it set to auto, so it'll automatically figure out whether this needs a, a classification or regression, uh, and then it'll do everything else for you, right? So you can go ahead and just uh, create that. Uh, really cool, really um, something I recommend playing around with. Again, so great, so those two notebooks to give you insight into what it's learning and what, and what it's gonna be doing. And uh, just one thing to note here, you're gonna see a list of models. Um, accuracy might not be what you're trying to optimize for, right? So you can see uh, in this top model that was created, it has 95% accuracy, um, but the latency is kind of high. You might want something, uh, you might not care as much about the accuracy, but more about the latency, depending on your use case. Uh, so you might choose a different model. But uh, again, this is something that's different for every person and their use case on how to best take advantage of that, and which model makes the most sense over here. Uh, again, this is an art, it's not just one model, the best model for everyone. So that was uh, autopilot. Um, I do see some questions coming in, wait till the end to start answering those. Uh, another interesting feature here about uh, the SageMaker Studio is uh, model monitor. Now model monitor is interesting. Uh, essentially you, in your, essentially what happens when you create a model, uh, the actual input your model sees over time might start changing, which actually degrades the performance of your model, right? So with model monitor, it does something interesting. It collects all of the, it starts collecting and storing all of the inputs that it gets, as well as the outputs it uh, sends back. And then from there, it also creates a baseline from your training data. And it uh, kind of does a lot of rules and statistics and sees, is there drift happening in your model? And if it is, it'll go ahead and alert you. You can set alarms in CloudWatch where it can alert you and letting you uh, know that those deviations are happening and then you can take actions accordingly uh, based on that. So that's a model monitor. And now we can move up to that top level of this stack on how we think of ML here at AWS. So these are the AI services that I mentioned before that we've worked on internally for something maybe at amazon.com or another service we created for our developers but essentially all of these are APIs that developers can just access. They don't need to have any machine learning expertise. And again, just to make note, this is for every developer, not just for developers without machine learning expertise. Uh, if you do find something over here, uh, definitely makes sense to take advantage of that first before recreating it if you don't need to. So uh, some of the services here, and let me know uh, if this doesn't work. I feel like I have audio issues every now and then, but. Amazon Polly is a uh, text-to-speech. Uh, it's a service that gets used quite a bit. 
so if you can't hear that, I'm not sure if you can. Hopefully you can. Uh, it, turn it up. Why don't you turn it up if you can? Okay, let me see if I can turn it up. Could you hear that, Ron? A little bit. Yeah, I'm getting the sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, basically, let me play that a little bit, but... So essentially, it's just natural sounding speech with Amazon Polly. Uh, it's also really accurate. Uh, in this case over here, you see the sentence today in Las Vegas uh, with the abbreviation of Nevada is nine degrees Fahrenheit. It actually understands that and uh, pronounces it properly. And now another one over here, we live for the music live from the Madison Square Garden. And then also, you, it's hard to trip it up with tongue twisters. I've tried. So this is a fun service to play around with. Again, this is something, that, again, you don't need that machine learning expertise. You can just take advantage of. Uh, another interesting one over here in that top level of AI services is Comprehend. So Comprehend is natural language processing, um, where it understands the different parts of speech. Now, Comprehend Medical is another domain of uh, Comprehend, right? So it understands uh, that medical domain. So you can see over here the notes uh, a doctor has uh, taken, right? So patient is for your mother, software engineer. You can see their abbreviations, misspellings, um, but it still understands what's what. So when you provide this to Comprehend, it automatically understands 4DYO is the age, and that's uh, protected health information. It can understand professions, medical conditions, anatomy, uh, all with that. And that's not all. It can also understand different types of dosages, the routes or modes, and the frequency of those dosages based on uh, these notes over here. So this is something that's pretty interesting. And uh, if you have a medical use case for this, you can check out the medical domain. Otherwise, check out the regular uh, Comprehend. Uh, so, like I mentioned earlier, uh, and actually when we first started this presentation, computer vision is a passion of mine. Uh, everything I showcased uh, with those um, garage door open or closed or counting how many people are in line or anything like that, I use SageMaker to build that out. But if you don't have uh, that machine learning expertise or you don't want to go down that route, you can also take a uh, look at Amazon recognition. So with recognition now, uh, which is our computer vision uh, API service, you can also just give it photos and give it categories and just uh, not have it to know any of that machine learning knowledge to train it. So for example, you can just give it a bunch of photos of the garage door open, a bunch of photos of the garage door closed and just label it appropriately. And then from there, you will have a model that lets you know whether the garage door is open or closed based on photos it's never seen before. It's really powerful. If you haven't played around recognition, I highly, highly recommend it. So Personalize is an interesting service. This actually takes advantage of uh, kind of autopilot, what we talked about under the hood over here. Uh, it, it basically, you're taking advantage of learnings uh, we've had from Amazon over the past 20 years on creating these individualized recommendations for customers. So essentially with Personalize, you provide an ex an, some sort of activity stream from your application, clicks, page views, signups, purchases, et cetera. Um, you can also provide items that you want to recommend. So inventory, for example, or articles or products or videos or music. Then uh, Personalize will go ahead and process and examine uh, the data and identify what is meaningful, select the right algorithms and train and optimize uh, a personalization model as customized for your data. So then you basically get a customized personalization API that will give you uh, real-time recommendations that you can either uh, do real-time again or just uh, in bulk. Now, uh, another service here that I also find fascinating, I haven't had a chance to play around with this one yet, is Amazon Kendra. It's our enterprise search service. Um, and essentially, uh, you, in the Kendra interface, you basically connect it to your different uh, data sources over here. Um, it can be unstructured data, uh, and then you can search through this data with natural language. Um, and there are many different types of connectors to connect uh, different types of data sources. Uh, so these are the connectors that will be coming and more will be coming soon. You have uh, quite a few over here where you can just go ahead and connect and you can search on that. Now here's an example of how this looks uh, in a default interface. So you can see over here, 
uh, you're using natural language as well. You're saying when is reInvent. You don't have to specify anything else for that. Uh, and then you can see things uh, such as uh, the suggested answer, frequently asked questions, and then you can see the uh, recommended documents. You will see the thumbs up, thumbs down right next to each one of those. So this is uh, retraining the Kendra to give you better uh, search results with these thumbs up, thumbs down as well. So that was a whirlwind tour of machine learning in AWS. Uh, I'll provide my email in the next slide, but if you really, if you want to dive uh, deeper down or have questions and you want to schedule some time to chat or walk through something, happy to do that. Uh, again, this is a passion of mine. I really enjoy this. Uh, if you want to learn more, we do have this machine learning university. It provides uh, 30 digital courses over 45 hours. Feel free to check that out. One thing I definitely recommend, uh, a lot of those notebooks and examples that I gave you are really well done. Uh, they're on GitHub, and I just wanted to make it easier for you to access. You can just go to bit.ly bit at, at the link over here, aws-sagemaker-examples. Uh, Definitely check that out as well. Um, if you need credits, uh, want to play around with any of these services, I'm happy to provide that too. Um, feel free to email me, kbatra at amazon.com, or reach out to me on Twitter at canal 732 And just again, Twitter by far is the best way to get in touch with me.